السلام عليكم ladies and gentlemen welcome to one of Nesteja Academy series of webinars that aim to share knowledge ideas and reflections on topics of interest new trends and rapid technology in the field of learning library information science knowledge management and digital transformation for our attendees from the GCC and the Arab region I wish you all had a pleased month of Ramadan filled with health, happiness, and blessing. In this webinar, we have a topic that is very ear catchy and mind stimulating. We will talk about designing libraries for the 21st century, the recent trends and new horizons in libraries. This topic is multi-dimensional in the over that blends architecture, interior design, technology integration, and user center. This is this is one. And the other thing is the unique reputation of our speaker tonight. Dear attendees, we are delighted to have with us Dr. Martha Irlido, the godmother of LIPWA, which is a, wide, <coughs> a widely known web-based survey offered by the Association of Research Libraries to help libraries assess and improve library services, change organizational culture, market the library, and last but not least, measure library user satisfaction qualitatively and quantitatively. Dr. Martha is a director and CEO of Quality Metrics. She has more than 22 years of leading research and analytics program at the Association of Research Libraries. She is co-developer of LibQual, Climate Qual, Means for Libraries, DigiQual, Live Value. Worked with multiple state libraries agencies on planning and evaluation for grants to state programs, the Institute of Museum and Library Service Supports. She also, she also planning new academic libraries uh, uh, building uh, re-innovation of public libraries and transformation of research library buildings. She published, published many papers and articles in library and information field. I like the most two of them with all my respect for the rest of her works. The first one entitled From Input and Output Measures to Quality and Outcomes Measures or From the User in the Life of the Library to the library in the life of the user. I like it so much, Martha, by the way. And the other one, which is strongly related to our topic tonight, entitled The Building Journey, <clears throat> The Winding Road to Successful Library Design. I would like to welcome you, Dr. Martha, and to get the maximum advantage of the uh, uh, time tonight, I will stop here and give you the virtu <coughs> virtual stage to start the webinar. Please, Dr. Martha. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a real honor to be here and to talk to you about designing libraries for the 21st century. We have a poll that we will launch and uh, the colleagues, yes, are helping me uh, launch it. Uh, we are asking you to identify whether you're representing a public library, an academic library, a school library, or a special library. So we have a sense of uh, the distribution of the audience. I you can we see, see that the, the academic coming. libraries take the lead. Yes. Yeah, the, you know, working for 22 years at the Association of Research Libraries has definitely con connected me with academic libraries for life. And, uh, but uh, I am uh, doing work uh, these days uh, in public libraries and in school libraries, and of course, in many special library environments like the state library agencies that you mentioned. Um, so, but but really happy to be talking with to about more than half of you are from academic libraries. So very familiar environment um, and setting uh, to a lot of the work I have done. So we can end the 
poll now and share the results so you can also see them. And uh, as you know, 56% from academic libraries, 15% from public libraries. And we do have 19% from school libraries and uh, uh, a small portion of special libraries. So we can stop sharing the poll. Thank you to all of you for actively sharing this information with us. <laughs> so I'm going to move on the slides. Let me actually uh, close the poll in front of me. Uh, so in this session, we will review primarily work that quality metrics supported that helps uh, libraries renew their service philosophy, improve their operations, and plan their future. Uh, it, quality Metrics is a library consulting firm that helps libraries transform to meet the needs of their community members in the 21st century. And uh, uh, I relatively recently uh, presented at um, uh, IFLA, that was last summer, um, just a little bit of more of a background for me. I was born and raised in Thessaloniki, Greece, uh, where I graduated from Aristotle University and uh, went to the US to study library and information science on a Fulbright scholarship. And, um, you know, that led me to the journey of working at ARL and establishing quality metrics. And last summer, I had the opportunity to present at the IFLA pre-conference on library buildings at Ghent in Belgium, where this slide is taken. And um, uh, for those who want to also see some of the latest things I have done, there is a recent podcast on the Librarian Linkover series. Uh, where uh, we talked about assessment and the skills needed in this area. And the podcast is actually available on Spotify if you want to listen to it. Uh, quality Metrics is engaged in visioning in strategy development, uh, in looking at staff values, skills, and competencies, in uh, planning and evaluation activities, and in facilities planning. And uh, uh, here is a little bit of my professional life trajectory. I finished my master's in library science and a second master's in educational psychology and evaluation and measurement from Kent State University in Ohio. That's where I went uh, when I got the Fulbright. And, you know, that led me into doing quite a bit of research and then uh, pursuing the PhD degree in library and information science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Now, as uh, the introduction uh, mentioned, I worked for two decades at the Association of Research Libraries, where I helped establish a variety of tools. And in 2016, I launched quality metrics that offers services to all types of libraries, public, academic, and school libraries, as well as mission-driven organizations and local governments. Once you start working with public libraries, you inevitably start working with um, the governments that um, manage those uh, libraries. In this presentation, we will review some of the work we have done to support libraries the last few years. And um, I want to sort of highlight that over the years, I have seen connections between different types of libraries, public libraries, academic libraries, state library agencies, and school libraries. And my recent work aims basically at transferring uh, the tools and competencies that we, where we see these environments have overlap um, uh, to, to learn from each other. 
Um, I believe we can learn a lot from each other when we understand the lifelong goals of our users and we can serve their needs better when we recognize that library interactions of a specific type or another is a kind of a passing moment in a more holistic experience that is shaped through a lifelong engagement people have with libraries and cultural and educational institutions. Um, so moving on, we do have a structure in this presentation uh, that will aim at sort of organizing the content along those five areas, understand the forces that are shaping future trends for libraries. We will review some strategy development frameworks as I have applied them in a few, in a couple of institutions I worked with. Uh, we will also see how we are capturing staff values, skills, and competencies that shape organizational cultures. And um, I will highlight some of the work I did with uh, an institution in that section as well. Uh, we will also see how planning and evaluation enables libraries to express the impact they have on their communities and close um, by understanding and highlighting the importance of the physical and virtual infrastructure um, that libraries have. I'm managing two screens here, so I want to make sure I'm moving along on both screens at the same time. So um, let's briefly uh, see what shapes uh, the future of libraries. I've highlighted four things, you know. We live in a world that is flooded with data. Uh, data management is a big issue, whether it's research data management or uh, even in the, you know, business world and in our everyday lives, big data and data mining is uh, is big beyond the research data. Uh, development of open source technologies, knowledge management in libraries, you know, all of that can be uh, captured in data management. Another big force is the digital landscape, how the digital paradigm changes, the emerging trends in digital governance, uh, the knowledge uh, we gain through social media uh, or the lack of knowledge sometimes uh, or even misinformation there. Uh, the tools and technology of social uh, network sites, the digital rights management, all of that are issues uh, captured under the digital landscape. Now transforming library spaces into social and cultural hubs is the other uh, element, the third element I highlighted there. Um, both the physical and virtual spaces are important environments for uh, social and cultural interactions. Uh, so designing libraries as learning commons, um, having virtual and physical environments for new services, uh, libraries um, as happening places uh, that uh, can be sustained. Uh, you know, these are some of the issues that are shaping um, the future of libraries in this third bullet point. And last, I put as a force the notion of emerging and innovative technology applications. And here we have, you know, things like uh, data repositories, the metadata standards, the what's happening with mobile applications, web and semantic technology applications in libraries, search strategies, uh, techniques in intelligence, information retrieval, you know, artificial intelligence security tools, 
uh, open access, trends in publishing, and research tools, technologies, and methodologies that are new and innovative. So, you know, all we, we've covered a lot of forces within these four bullet points, uh, but um, I hope you can see the challenge we have uh, as we are facing these uh, forces that are shaping the future of libraries. Now, among all of those forces, the most important for libraries, I think, is the balance between the physical and the virtual services. Being able to deliver value to our library users in both of these environments, and more importantly, in ways that these two environments are working seamlessly together is a big challenge. We want to be connected in both physical and virtual um, mean, you know, with both of these means to our users. And often at the same time, uh, emphasizing physicality while also emphasizing virtuality. Uh, ultimately, we want to be able to experience both of these dimensions with the same quality of experience. And it's not easy, but that's the ultimate goal. Um, get my there. So um, I, I, I will highlight some work I did at Montana State University, but when I, I went to capture uh, to make sure that, you know, the strategic plan I worked with uh, Montana State was still on their website. Uh, I noticed a new website they had, and what captured my attention was, you know, they had this very welcoming picture on the homepage, and if you see at the bottom uh, there, it says, we are glad you are here. Uh, welcome to your library. This picture is in front of the library at Montana State University, and it, it is the web page. And the web page basically says, welcome, to, and it's a representation of the physical library building in this picture. So I really thought they did a good job at sort of merging this physical and digital world in a very simple way by redesigning uh, the web page of the library uh, with a picture of the physical library. Um, and I thought it was exemplifying the point I was trying to make about this importance to tie the physical and the virtual world together. So the, the goal of, you know, the, what should be driving the, the design of bringing these worlds together is the mission of the organization. It, at Quality Metrics, we have a very strong belief on what we call mission-driven design. You know, what is it you want to serve um, to your community? What is the core purpose of your existence? That is what should drive uh, the design of um, your services. And uh, for uh, research libraries for academic libraries. Uh, we can see here that our mission can be driven uh, by two major um, areas, strengthening research library performance on the one hand and influencing the scholarly information environment. And almost, you know, all of these activities are sort of in an endless loop, we focus on issues and analysis by articulating and representing the interests of all campus constituencies. We advocate for their needs. We engage them in conversations. We try to know who they are. We try to energize the campus to act collectively with community forums. Uh, and inform and mobilize the campus and the community. And um, the goal is to enable library-wide and university-wide engagement with research and scholarly production in 
an academic environment, for example. And um, uh, the uh, this mission-driven design and the specific uh, version of the uh, of you know articulation of the mission-driven design. It's something we we used at some of the work we did at Boston University recently. So what does our mission and vision say about our physical and virtual environments? Go back and see whether you have articulated in your current strategy, in your current mission and vision statements, anything about what the library looks like and what the, uh, you know, uh, in the physical world and what the library looks like in the virtual world. Uh, remember that websites talk, they tell you something. And also buildings talk, they tell you something, they convey a message. And you want both, you know, what your um, website talk is and what your building talk is to, to be in sync uh, in many ways. And as we work with uh, libraries that are in the midst of transformation, I mean, we have many well-established libraries in the U.S. that were built, you know, 50, 60 years ago that need renovations. Uh, as we work with these libraries, uh, you know, we start from that mission-driven design and try to articulate uh, the vision and the principles and the services they need to be offering in uh, this new renovated uh, building. Uh, Boston University, as I mentioned, is a place where we did some of this recent work and they have now moved into the phase of working with an architectural firm to articulate the program for the renovation of the Mugger Library uh, at Boston University. So keep an eye on that work. It's gonna be exciting when uh, it gets completed. Th these types of work take many years to be completed, as you can imagine. Um, you know, it's not unusual that uh, a renovation can take anywhere between, you know, four or five years at minimum to 10 or even more years if the funding is not there and you need to spend time fundraising. So moving on, let's look at some of the strategic development frameworks we have used in uh, some of the organizations we've worked with uh, to uh, articulate, again, this mission-driven design. Uh, this is some of the early work we did at Chapman University. Um, as you can see in a lot of my work, the balance scorecard or a version of it I call the value scorecard has influenced quality metrics thinking. Uh, so in this uh, view of uh, Chapman, Chapman's library of the future, uh, you can actually see the emphasis on the user, uh, empowering student success and supporting research initiatives on campus are sort of the key outcomes that uh, are guiding the design of, um, of the vision here. Uh, and then it gets to more specific value proposition areas with the personalized experiences, uh, seamless access to, uh, to content, opportunities for collaboration through partnership. And we have a number of enablers uh, at the bottom, um, facilities, resources, you know, the services around data, um, the information literacy services and uh, innovative technologies and nothing, nothing can be done without uh, the really important and valuable work library staff do. Uh, so having library staff that are well-trained, 
and uh, you know invest on their development and growth is a key element so this is the way we captured the mission-driven aspect of uh, Chapman University Library. Leatherby Libraries is um, the libraries. Um, it, all the Leatherby Libraries at Chapman University, let me go back, are in one building, but the different parts of the building represent different uh, libraries. That's why it's called the Leatherby Libraries. Uh, this is the uh, uh, strategic framework I was looking on the Montana State University Library. Uh, it's still there. I would encourage you to go and look at it. It was a seven-year strategic plan. And, uh, you know, I know that there is a new director there. And at some point, this is going to be refreshed. But it is uh, one of the early strategic plans uh, quality metrics worked with. And um, uh, it is complemented with various dashboards uh, that uh, are also useful to look at. So that's why I mention it here. As we um, have worked with many state library agencies on uh, what are called Library Services and Technology Act plans and evaluations, um, we have been using this relatively simple framework of discovery, uh, doing a lot of systematic data collection, analysis and exploration of the data, trying to synthesize this data and, you know, offer the report, whether it's an evaluation report or a new plan. And the LSTA evaluation and plans have five-year cycles, and that's mandated by law in uh, the U.S. Uh, so, um, you know, we do an evaluation of what happened in the last five years. Um, and as soon as that finishes, within six months, we have to, you know, state library agencies have to turn around and produce the plan for the next five years. So both the um, evaluations and the plans for the state library agencies um, are very uh, helpful to look at. A lot of that work funds public library activities um, through a funding stream that comes from the federal government to the state agencies and provides grants to public libraries that ideally they use them to do innovative things and try new things above and beyond their operating budget, public library budgets. As you, as you may know, uh, are primarily to a large extent, you know, uh, the money comes from the local governments. But this uh, federal state funding stream allows them to um, innovate and try new things um, without threatening their operational budget lines. So the plans uh, are all available on the IMLS website, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and all of the ev most recent evaluations are available there as well. Now the goal when we do these evaluations uh, is to, to try and when we do mission-driven design work uh, with institutions is to capture all the stakeholders leave no one behind, you know, make sure we, we, you have identified all the key constituencies, um, all the key user groups. Um, so a lot of attention needs to, to happen on that. Um, for those who may not have seen it, I, I just, uh, I think earlier today, I noticed that uh, Hathi Trust has come with a new strategic plan. Even though we did not work on that, I thought a lot of the methods they, they were using were very similar to what Quality Metrics has been using in its mission-driven design. So I would recommend that you take a good look at that as well. Now, moving on, um, we, as we said, we have to remember that it's not only the 
uh, end users we serve. Uh, you know, we often survey them, we ask them what they want, and then we deliver on what they want um, on the voice of the customer. Uh, but it's not only our uh, external customers we need to be paying attention. As I mentioned in, in earlier on, staff and how they feel is very important. So we have done work uh, with a number of organizations that have implemented the Climate Call uh, Survey. As a reminder, the Climate Call Survey measures the climate for justice, the climate for leadership, the climate for diversity, for demographic diversity, for innovation at the team level, for continual learning, teamwork, customer service, and psychological safety at the library level. There is a book that uh, Charles Lowry uh, put together that has a number of chapters on uh, climate call and its development. Uh, in addition to these uh, climate scales, uh, the tool, the full length tool, has a number of attitude scales. And these include things like job satisfaction, the commitment one has to the organization, the citizenship behaviors, the, you know, feelings of organizational withdrawal uh, and psychological empowerment in the workplace, task engagement and work unit conflict. Uh, in, there is a climate call light version that doesn't include the attitude scales and only includes the uh, organizational climate scales. And the actual tool is offered through ARL, but we work with libraries to help them um, take the findings and, um, you know, make them real and interpret them in a meaningful way within their environment. So we did work with the University of Oregon. And one of the things um, that implemented Climate Call through ARL, and one of the things we did was to take the University of Oregon values uh, the library values and map them to the climate call scales. Okay, as we look at these values that this library has, what is it in the climate call results they should be paying attention to, uh, to understand uh, which parts of how their uh, library staff uh, feel um, relate to which uh, parts of the survey results they get uh, from ARL. So you can see the mapping here of the library values to the scales, um, as well as the organizational attitude scales, the organizational climate scales and the organizational attitude scales. And that was another example of how we worked internally with uh, uh, to understand the, the staff uh, feelings and opportunities for improvement. Uh, that work was followed up with extensive focus groups. Uh, we did um, beyond the sort of secondary interpretation of the climate call results uh, and the um, focus groups ended up resulting in very specific recommendations for, for improvements that the leader there, uh, you know, uh, engaged with. Um, and um, when we, all of this was happening, you... yes. Yes, please go ahead. Please and go. Well, please all go. of this was happening, I was going to say there was a leadership tra transition at the University of Oregon. So this effort was, um, uh, you know, very meaningful as um, uh, they, they were through a transition uh, phase. Uh, in, now, in a couple of, of just... yeah. Yeah, to, to, to give just uh, uh, two seconds to announce that uh, all, uh, for our, all our attendees, uh, the question and queries could be written in the Q&A books. And uh, by the end of uh, Dr. Martha Woodenar, uh, uh, she will answer it. Also, I need to announce that uh, we have uh, an Arabic uh, uh, translation at the same time on the globe down there. So thank you. I just need just to announce this for our attendees who just uh, join us uh, shortly. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for, uh, especially with the translation 
Uh, that's very important. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the, in the next section, we will look at a couple of planning and evaluation approaches that uh, have helped uh, libraries express their impact, the impact they have on their communities. Um, you know, the assessment cycle is not linear, as you know, it's a continuous cycle of improvement. Um, and that's what this um, image tries to capture. Uh, you know, we, we never stop. Uh, you know, we identify outcomes, collect data, analyze data, share results, implement changes, and then uh, you know, we capture what the impact of that change is and then the cycle starts again. Uh, so it's a constant uh, cycle of improvement. And even though we think about input, output and outcome data is kind of linear, it's not really linear. Again, you know, it, it's a loop. And, um, you know, there is a lot happening in libraries when it comes to outcomes. Um, but uh, we also need to remember uh, that uh, outcomes is kind of a even short term element, even though, you know, it's a user benefit, uh, the true value and impact are even further down into the future, longer term benefits. And I think this um, image from, uh, you know, very classic work that or wrote in 1973 uh, captures exactly this very long-term beneficial effects that uh, capture the value of libraries. So remember inputs, outputs, outcomes, even, uh, even outcomes ki are kind of short-term elements, but there are longer-term beneficial effects of the, on the value of library. Um, but uh, when it comes to Capturing data, one of the starting points is the needs of the community. And I want to show you some of the ways we are doing design thinking work in libraries uh, to admission driven work in libraries um, in engaging, fun, uh, and uh, colorful ways. Uh, this is some of the work we were doing, uh, designing a new building uh, in California for a community college. And uh, uh, we ended up having a town uh, forum uh, where people had a number of exercises around the room and they had to tell us um, wh what kind of environment they prefer, uh, to give us ideas about what they want the new building to look like, what services we need to uh, let go, and what new services we need to create. Um, this was a similar kind of data gathering we did uh, on a public library in Alaska, in Fairbanks, Alaska, the Nolwim Public Library. So, you know, these are tools that we have used both in academic libraries and in public libraries. Design thinking work, um, especially when it comes to rethinking your virtual and uh, uh, physical spaces, have a lot of similarities across different types of libraries. Um, we also did uh, uh, intercept data collection on the left uh, side there you see us having boards at the entrance of the library uh, and we've done this also at Boston University as well as at Nolwyn Public Library. On the right hand again it's another community forum uh, at the Nolwyn Public Library. Uh, here is a better view of the kind of climate environment they want, this or that, where people put their sticky um, dots. The different colors uh, reflect different user groups. So like we would give the yellow to the kids walking into the public library and the blue, uh, you know, to the adults and uh, the, um, the green to the teenagers. So we try to sort of 
capture the segments of the population uh, as they were coming in with this color coding. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is, uh, it explains uh, the different colors for the dot voting. Uh, for, and then this same coloring scheme, uh, we used it um, asking people to uh, put their votes um, on the type of space they wanted. Um, this, it looks very messy uh, when they put their dots on these pictures. And here is uh, what it looks like when we process the data uh, and we can see more clearly, you know, what kind of spaces uh, people want. Um, again, this is part of the intercept data gathering we did at uh, the Nolwyn Public Library. We did that work back in 2018, 2019, and uh, uh, the library was emptied last uh, fall uh, and uh, they started construction and this summer they will be moving uh, in and it takes time in Fairbanks, Alaska because it's very cold there. Uh, the, the summer lasts three, four months and that's really the only uh, time when they can build new buildings. Another thing we did uh, there with the data we, we had, they had done a user survey. So we took the user survey data they had and we uh, captured the personas uh, they had uh, surfacing from the data. And we had about 12 different personas. I presented that in a paper actually at the QQML conference. Um, the quantitative and qualitative measures for libraries conference. Uh, now, uh, 12 personas, it's a lot of personas for a public library. Uh, and when we had the town forum, there comes a person in the room and in the middle of the meeting and said, you know, I had to come to this meeting. I knew it was important. I come and use the library once a month. And this was a persona we hadn't captured in the data. It wasn't in the data, but he just walked into our town hall meeting. Uh, it is the slope worker who basically goes and works in the forests of, uh, uh, of Alaska and comes in town once every month and goes to the library and uses the library uh, a lot, but only in the sense that he, you know, takes a lot of CDs and DVDs and books. Uh, but he comes only once a month. And uh, if he hadn't walked into the library, we wouldn't have captured that persona. It was a, a good lesson learned um, to always be vigilant and no one and leave no one behind. Uh, so, um, oh, this is um, a, a picture from Boston College. When we were doing the work at uh, Boston University, we had the opportunity to visit all the other libraries in Boston. And Boston really is, is a kind of, um, kind of a heaven for libraries. Uh, a lot of academic libraries are there. Uh, the director of Boston College, his name is Tom Wall. So he had created a feedback uh, wall <laughs> where people were putting uh, their sticky notes with ideas and um, questions they had about the library. And uh, uh, he systematically was responding to the answers uh, to the questions to to the, the wall. Um, so, you know, you get the answer directly from Tom Wall in Boston College. It's a, it's a kind of interesting pan on his last name being, his na last name being Wall. Uh, so he had the answer Wall in the library he's directing. Um, this is a, a kind of um, uh, incremental renovation approach he's following. Uh, you know, he had, and many libraries are doing that, especially academic libraries, 
they start renovating a floor at a time. Uh, so you have a building that has some floors re renovated and other floors not renovated, but you know, you keep on building, you keep on uh, creating and recreating the vision and you keep on gathering data. Uh, so I thought this was a very good example. Oh, I sh and I have to show you some live call charts. I'm not going to go into detail explaining the radar charts to you, but um, this is kind of showing you the kind of impact these live call data can have on uh, space design. Uh, these data are from York University in the UK uh, that uh, did live call many times. And uh, you can see that they had red. Red is sort of the area where you have some deficit uh, in the information control dimension and in the library is place dimension. And you can see from 2004 to 2008, the red increased. So things were getting worse. Uh, so they knew they had to do something. They had to do some renovations. And uh, uh, they ended up doing the renovations. They planned in 2010 when the actual renovation was taking place. You can see how much worse things were for the users. And I often tell that to people when they launch into these uh, renovation projects, things will get worse before they get better from a user experience perspective. Um, because it is disruptive, you know, to, um, in that, you know, at the Nolwyn library, public library I was telling you earlier, they had to close the whole, the building in order to be able to, to renovate it. How disruptive can that be? Uh, so you do see uh, that uh, disruption reflected in the user data. But then when the renovation is over and you have the new building opening in 2012, you can actually see how um, there is no red. Uh, so uh, users were fully satisfied uh, with the new environment they were receiving at the University of York. So this is quite powerful, I think, um, design data to have in addition to the other market research and the other engagement activities I showed you um, earlier. So I hope through uh, some of these examples, uh, we all can start seeing the importance of uh, infrastructure uh, and uh, this kind of design thinking uh, work um, is important both for the physical and for the, the virtual uh, world. Um, so as you look into your building and as you look into your website, think what message does our existing website send to the public? What message does our existing building send to the public? Is our mission reflected in the building? Is our mission reflected on the website? And is the website and the building true to our mission in a, in a way that are in sync together? Just a couple of examples of pictures, you know, take a picture of your library and show it to your friend and ask them to tell you what is this picture telling you about this space and gather that feedback. What message do you want your new or remodeled facility to send? If you were to redesign that space, how different would you want that message to be like? Here is another picture. What message does this library uh, convey. Again, you know, take a picture of your different spaces, do this test, um, 
we are always here, of course, to be working with you. So think of us as a partner in this process. Um, another uh, way to uh, capture a kind of vision for the future is to think of what you want the headlights, the uh, headline to read if you were to renovate the library. Or what would a headline article um, look like if you had a new website and you suddenly announced your new website to your community? What does that headline, uh, what would that headline say? Uh, this is a very simple exercise to do and I would recommend that, uh, uh, you know, you, you do it frequently, more frequently uh, than uh, just whenever you are to redesign. Um, in general, there are multiple methods uh, to be used whenever we do um, mission-driven design and design thinking work. Uh, some of it is, you know, research in the sense that we have unanswered questions we want to find answers to, and some of it is evaluation uh, where we want to see whether some solution we've implemented has worked or not. Uh, Quality Metrics has also developed a very extensive webinar series. It's uh, uh, three uh, webinars of two and a half hours each. And we offer that uh, once a year. Um, so I've just settled the dates for this coming uh, series. It's going to take place in November, December. So if you want to, to join us, you know, feel free to send me an email and I'll send you the registration. Um, it should be coming up in the coming weeks. I do want to highlight uh, the work Hickerson, Lippincott and Crema have put together uh, for designing libraries for the 21st century. This is an open access publication that you can find and it's available through ALA. Also the um, other two guides you see here about public library facilities for the future, an outdoor placemaking starter kit that the Delaware Division of Libraries has produced are available open access and they speak to uh, design thinking work in the public library environment. Uh, so all of these resources are freely available to you and I hope you'll take a look at them. Now, if you ever uh, come to any of the following forums, I usually try to attend them either physically or virtually. Sometimes uh, it has to be virtually. Uh, the Library Assessment Conference uh, is taking place every two years, as you know, and we are going to have an in-person event in uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, in November this year, the first time we are coming back in person uh, after uh, four years of doing uh, virtual events. The UK-based event that's called International Conference on Library Performance Measures uh, has been uh, doing virtual events for the last four years, but the next one will most likely be in person. It's in 2025 that the next one will take place. And of course, uh, the QQML conference that I mentioned um, is uh, being organized by colleagues in Greece. And uh, I have, I usually uh, do a presentation there if uh, not in person in a virtual uh, manner uh, and QQML is taking place every year and it's being offered both virtually and physically. Um, so these are some of the forums. I wanted to thank you and I'm here available for your questions.
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Martha. And uh, really, uh, this was a very outstanding and interesting presentation that took us to another level of looking at designing libraries with the aim of creating, inviting, uh, uh, adaptable and accessible and intellectual space in the library. So I think that's uh, transformed the library into a cultural center of learning, discovery, and the community engagement for sure. So thank you so much. And now let's open the gate for receiving questions and queries from our attendees. And uh, let's start uh, <clears throat> that with an introductory question. From uh, your experience, uh, Dr. Martha, how far the local culture could affect on designing the library? And uh, do you have examples for that from your huge number of projects? Yeah, the, I think the local culture is, is uh, something unique and should always be featured in, in uh, these projects. Um, for example, Alaska is a very unique environment. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it would be a mistake not to reflect that uniqueness in, in the design. Um, the uh, Boston is a very different environment. Um, there was a lot of um, thought and reflection happening with the Mugar Library. It's a brutalistic type of design and, um, you know, a lot of um, care um took place to maintain some of that uh, of those principles uh so uh, understanding the uh, the value of the uh current design and mm -hmm. being able to um you know maintain it where it's an important element for the culture of the institution is is very important and i think yeah both of the nolwin library public library in Alaska and the sort of example of Boston University with the Mugger library um, are good examples where they are aiming to maintain those elements. Um, in the Nolwyn library there was uh, in the library itself a mural in the children's department that had a very mm -hmm. unique historical value for the community there. Wow. It was painted by a local artist mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, mm -hmm. everybody would tell you through all of our meetings, this was kind of a sacred wall, you know, no matter what was going to change in the library, that wall had to be maintained. So understanding Perfect. those unique cultural assets in every environment is very important. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm sure that makes the library more vivid and close to the uh, uh, patrons, users, uh, and uh, make them just spend more time just in this ambience. Uh, the yeah, one, the yeah. you know the, the stories were like you know this mural was something that only the kids could relate to, but the parents who were you know, were visiting the library when they were kids. This mural is that kind of a symbol that was there for mm -hmm. the partners' uh, lifetime and for the kids. Perfect. Perfect. So the whole family enjoying their time there. The next question is about uh, how to embed the designing factor in the library strategy. Uh, actually, to be force factor that convince the library top management to spend the amount of money needed in this area? I think this is a very strategic question, is right? Yes. Yes. Um, it, it's, um, uh, you know, sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. Sometimes, they, you know, mm -hmm. people may not be ready to, to see the need for uh, physical change, renovation, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, they have other priorities, they want to invest things elsewhere, um, and even, even when someone recognizes the priority and the need to invest uh, in improvement and change, um, the resources may not be there, and, you um, it may take a number of years to do the fundraising. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would say, um, you know, you can always 
do small design thinking work by renovating a corner, by renovating even just a, a small seating area. Uh, there was a series of grants that um, OCLC uh, gave through a project called Small Libraries Create Smart Spaces. Uh, these were a grants $5,000 uh, to each library. And they were going to small libraries and small rural libraries. And the goal was that they were going to do this kind of design thinking work to renovate basically mm -hmm. a corner of, of their library, you know, a small seating area with 5,000. Mm -hmm. So things can be small in the design thinking world. Um, and you can start with, uh, you know, a very small area and even if you even if you don't have the 5000 you can still do prototyping and try ideas and showcase ideas because it's fun and creative work so i would say yeah keep on creating and keep on having fun and hopefully the tide will change yeah and, and as you said that starts small and then it could grow convincing uh, yeah. uh, uh companies or any uh, stakeholders outside so they can I think they are willing to to grant something for the library uh, especially that's will affect about the service uh, the next question it's uh, about uh, the academic library means and special libraries so most of them now is uh, moving uh, uh, into green being the screen library so would you uh, talk more about this approach from a designing prospect please yeah, some of the uh, the green is sort of the desire to bring the outside inside, right? And and the inside outside. Um, and I think uh, because of COVID, maybe we're more, um, um, you know, we spend so many months in isolation. Um, mm -hmm. You know. The, there is a lot of that desire to to have um, the outdoors sort of come in, in, in the light, in the green, um, in the colors we choose. Um, it's, uh, I would recommend that uh, um, a resource, uh, the, especially the, let me go back to the slides here. Um, the outdoor placemaking starter kit is actually quite insightful on mm -hmm. giving you uh, ways to think um, about how the, the you can bring the outdoors inside. Um, now you have to be careful also into, uh, you know, we, we want often to create green walls uh, with natural plants and um, I would caution there in the sense that, you know, you, you want to be able to maintain the greenery you are creating mm -hmm. indoors. Um, so just make sure when you go the green way that you can sustain it mm -hmm. um, in the long term. Yeah, sure. Thank you for this uh, very telegraphic answer because we have many questions coming down the road and we encourage our attendees to write down because we need to take uh, as many as we can of the questions so we are opening to write it down because we can having this as a, a talk uh, questions okay so uh, now we have question related to the technology uh, what do you think of artificial intelligence and using new technologies uh, in the libraries uh, and at the same time this could affect about enjoying the building i like this question by the way yeah, um, I, I think our AI, artificial intelligence, is is at the same time so much has has happened and so little has happened, right? So it's it's new and we're and it's always going to be new and it's mm -hmm. always going to be changing so fast. Um, and how do we engage it and bring it into uh, our design thinking world? world? Uh, I think it, it does have the potential to be a force for good, 
equally, mm -hmm. you know, it can be also a force for not so good. I mean, we, these things we have to be careful with, but clearly, you know, it, it can help us with being more creative, um, especially when it comes to processing uh, images and, uh, uh, you know, giving us uh, alternative ways of viewing things uh, and uh, design thinking terms in images and pictures. Um, so um, I would say try it, but also be careful and uh, make sure, you know, you recognize the contribution of AI whenever we bring it into our work. Yeah, I think some sort of, of uh, what we call it, uh, integrating technology and also the, 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 the customized building with a very functional uh, way will uh, make this win-to-win -win deal just using the technology and at the same time enjoying the physical environment. Uh, this question, I think, brought, brought to my mind a question related to the uh, moving to the virtual uh, world, like Second Life, virtual reality. And no. do you think that this, again, minimize a little bit uh, the, the visits to the building itself and the library on site? Uh, well, you know, we many libraries have not recovered to the pre-COVID levels of use. Um, electronic use did increase, um, you know, um, uh, during the last four or five years. Um, mm -hmm. I do see environments where things have come back because people are hungry to sort of get back and socialize. Uh, in a physical sense together, but not all of the environments have recovered to uh, mm -hmm. the pre-COVID level of physical engagement. And some probably will never uh, reach back to that level mm -hmm. of physical engagement. So I, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where specifically you are, uh, but you know, we we will have environments that will never be physically at the level they were in the Different. past, mm -hmm. and think you know environments where they will gradually reach there, and yet um, we are also seeing key uh, areas where recovery has happened and the physical engagement is even more intense than what it was, um, you know, before COVID, fewer of those. So, um, you know, all of these three scenarios are distinct possibilities and understanding uh, where you are on that trajectory uh, is important and figuring out, you know, if, if there, there are places that they will never physically engage at the level of engagement they were uh, before the pandemic, um, what does that mean for that environment? Hmm. Um, I think there are some big unanswered uh, questions we are still struggling with. This is not unlike to Okay, how much of an organization's work can be done 100% virtually versus 100% mm. physically? Who's who's doing the um, kind of 100% physical work and who's doing the 100% mm. virtual world and never needs to step a foot within the organization? And uh, I think we, we are seeing a lot of blended um, work environments um, these days, uh, things where um, we haven't quite sorted yet uh, what is needed. Uh, we feel comfortable okay. telling people, oh, okay, you come for one or two days in the office. Uh, so we have that physical interaction, but you know, you can work the rest of the um, of the time from home. Um, oftentimes, I think in many of these positions, we, we haven't quite settled, is it truly a hybrid um, 
engagement, work engagement that uh, is the ideal for that position? Or is it just uh, because we are not quite sure yet what's the ideal? Yeah, so I think I, there are a lot of unanswered questions on. Um, yeah, and, uh, and I think this is big, put a big uh, responsibility on the librarian just to create and innovate uh, uh, new ways, new services that attract the people to come back and especially children and uh, be proactive more than just reactive to, to this one, because I think it's not an easy area, uh, period of time that uh, Corona, uh, it needs a lot of work just to make the people just uh, uh, get to the normal again. Uh, yeah, okay. and and you know we will have to innovate in in all of these uh, you know in in the hundred percent physical world, mm -hmm. the hundred percent virtual world, and in the blended world, mm -hmm. we will have to in to innovate in all of these three scenarios. But I don't think we have quite settled yet, especially um, wherever we have these hybrid. Uh, work environments. Uh, I th I think sometimes we're uncertain, and and for some of these hybrid uh, work, um, it it'll sort out. It may take a little bit more time, a little bit more thinking, a little bit more creativity, a little bit more design. You know, um, more dialogue. I think. Yeah. And Maybe, yes, for sure. Okay, um, user satisfaction is a complicated term. I think you agree with me in some level. So uh, what do you uh, think uh, how this uh, could reflect on the aspect of user satisfaction? How, how do you think that uh, user satisfaction can be identified in a way that we can say that we achieved user satisfaction in, in some level? Especially you are, as I said, the, the godmother of live call, and this is a very effective tool to measure quantitatively and uh, qualitatively uh, uh, way the user satisfaction. Yeah, um, it, it definitely the the live call model assumes um, a, an environment uh, where both physical and virtual resources are available and tries to sort of uh, evaluate that experience. Uh, I, I truly think uh, we need um, uh, slightly different tools when it comes to um, getting a better picture of the physical only world as well as uh, you know slightly different tools when it comes to getting a full picture of the digit of the digital only world uh, so you know Litecoin will continue to have i think a place in our assessment toolkit um, but uh, you know some of these design thinking exercises uh, you saw um, we're aiming a little bit more for the physical only world, especially the ones that were about building new buildings. And um, uh, when it comes to usability and web design, uh, there is a whole set of engagements too that are similar that can be utilized um, and that are unique for the web environment. Uh, mm -hmm. So even though the principles on design thinking were work for physical and virtual uh, are sort of the same, the actual specific exercises will differ quite mm -hmm. a bit. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Thank you for this very uh, quick uh, answer because you have, uh, again, uh, many questions. I try to uh, merge some of them. The next question is about the the uh, trend to the maker space within the public library. So how do you see this uh, approach uh, will affect the library design? Yeah, it's, um, um, you know, an interesting, uh, many public libraries have engaged with maker spaces and academic libraries also have now created some maker spaces. They do not always have the resources to support them in the sort of full way because you need to be able to continuously you know fund the 
materials that that you need for the uh, maker space, the sort of um, uh, you know disposable things that are much like it, paper and ink and pencils and papers. Where in the physical world you have, depending on what is you are doing in your maker space environment, you have materials you need to be buying and constantly utilizing. Um, uh, so um, making sure you have you know enough funding to do this work is important uh, if it's happening in the public library I, I also see in many environments where this is not coming into the libraries because you know in an academic environment the engineering school has established you know yeah. a handful of um, of these maker spaces or um, technology uh, labs and they are suddenly opening the use of these labs to everybody on campus. Um, so if that is happening, you may not need to establish one necessarily in the library as long as, again, there mm -hmm. is something that's available for the whole community. Uh, and the same with the public library environment. In some communities, uh, you know, they prefer to create kind of a a science museum and bring some of the uh, making culture in there um, and uh, oh, some public libraries are comfortable with that others mm -hmm. would like to see some of that happening within their own space um, you know they may partner a little bit more intentionally um, so I, I see a number of scenarios in, in terms of how maker spaces play out in relation to uh, libraries. I do think that libraries and library staff have an important role to play to be aware of mm -hmm. what is possible to do in a maker space environment and mm -hmm. to um, you know whether you you have that within your own floors or a spaces or it is, you know, into the next building, I think being aware of what's possible and directing the users to the resources they need um, is probably the most critical uh, aspect and service the librarians can offer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, we are glad that we have many uh, academics and professors of us. So Professor Ahmed Bashir just Wrote again uh, the the, the uh, challenge of the technology, and he asked that again. Do you think the introduction of AI li uh, and libraries uh, based service uh, would make the library less visited places? <laughs> we, we need to elaborate more of this one because I think it's it's, it's yeah. A it depends on what kind of a library uh, you know you you, you will be. Um, AI library-based services will make, uh, uh, I, I would say it depends. Um, it depends on the type of library you are. Um, in, some, in some libraries will be more visited and other libraries will be less visited. Um, I think there will be differentiation. Um, and, um, you know, some libraries may not need to be uh, visited frequently. I mean, you know, we, we're going to have to store somewhere uh, mm -hmm. multiple copies of physical books. And we, for many of the uses, we will not need to actually um, have in our hands the physical book. Um, but there will always be some space, or at least we hope there will always be some space where the physical artifact is stored safely. So for those, you know, more rare um, occasions where we're going to need to use the physical artifact, we will be able to go and touch yes. it and use it. Yes, uh, the, the, the original manuscript and, this, uh, and also having this... Uh, two ways uh, integration between the virtual and also physical will be uh, what we call it uh, a good uh, solution for that. 
Uh, we have a question here, uh, and again, I need to thank uh, Professor Ahmed Bashir for, for participating with us. Uh, what are the, sta the key standards or criteria you see is most important for designing modern life? I think this is the million question, million dollars question. They, uh, now, there are Many, a few, you know, there are standards in the sense of, you know, the um, energy efficient buildings, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what we're talking about? Um, the kind of engineering uh, standards? Um, I, th I think we do want, and then, uh, you know, a, lead buildings, all of our buildings eventually need to be energy efficient. So that's very important. There is a lot of effort happening uh, in many campuses and in many communities uh, to um, maintain the infrastructure and to upgrade the infrastructure. At the same time, honestly, there is a lot of infrastructure that still needs to be upgraded. So it, it's um, some ways it's uh it's easy to sort of uh you know close your eyes close your ears and uh um you know close your mouth and sort of uh you know no see uh no hear uh the the things you don't want to hear um it's um it's not always politically appealing to say that there is a lot of this infrastructure that needs updating. Yeah. Um, it's easier to build a new gym um, and say, hey, you know, here is a new gym or here is a new swimming pool. Um, and it's a more politically expedient, uh, you know, thing you can do. Uh, yeah, to, you know, refreshing infrastructure that has aged or making the decision to take it down you know these are some of the tougher decisions but um you know it won't go away it is there so we have to act on it yeah i'm totally agree with you and uh, um, the last question because we have many of us and we encourage our attendees to send it over the email because we have to stick to our time and we uh, also need to commit it to what we agreed with uh, Dr. Martha. So the last question, your prospect, your future vision for designing library, Dr. Martha, how do you see it uh, after 10 or 20 years from now? Hopefully that uh, there will be a generation oh that can, can, yeah. can see your, your uh, your uh, vision after this time I, yeah I, my own thinking is changing so much from year to year you know if you asked me five years ago uh, i would never have guessed i was going to be involved in this type of work at the depth i have gotten involved mm -hmm. in and definitely um 10 years ago uh, it wasn't as close to you know on my radar screen so i'm i'm going to take a pass and say invite me back in 10 years and let's discuss <laughs> the vision i, I can tell there is a big change on your appearance or stuff like that i knew you from long time so you, you are ageless woman so you didn't change so much <laughs> thank you thank you so much so um, I would like to thank you so much, you uh, Martha, for sure. You really made our day with this very easy and also interesting way of delivering this sophisticated uh, knowledge. I can tell about this also. Um, I can uh, uh, talk on behalf of many of the uh, professionals and also academics for you for uh, inventing and uh, developing such uh, uh, effective tools to measure uh, library services. It's something, uh, as I tell, for the history, and you were just talking about this, for sure, uh, we mentioned your effort. So thank you, waiting for more engagement for you on your side, wish you all the best. And uh, I will leave the last word for you as our, you, our owner guest, please, Martha. Go ahead. Thank Martha. you very much. Yeah, keep, stay in touch with me, and yeah, let let's uh, keep talking about uh, the ways our virtual and physical environments are changing. 
Stay in touch. Yeah, sure, for sure. And I would like to thank all our attendees. شكرا لكم جميعا و نتمنى لكم شهرا مليئا بالمغفره و نسالكم دائما الدعاء والسلام عليكم جميعا. Thank you all and appreciate your attendance and see you in the next webinars from Nasija Khan. Thank you all. Thank you, Martha. Bye bye. Bye bye.